That'll be enough. That's good. I'm satisfied with that. I do want to Yes, I just probably need to move. Actually, yeah, it's just not not it's not the visual. It's the sound. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. So Peter, thanks again for bringing me back. Not that big of a deal, but. You're going to have to use your powerful voices. Okay. Please. Well, we have pretty, we yeah, have pretty powerful voices. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, should we start? Yeah. Let's do Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, you're at Architect Berlin. This is our offline space. Yes. Our office, and we have lots of working space. Architect Berlin is a networking platform for creatives in Berlin. For Have you come here because of Architect, or have you... Because you heard it somewhere else. I'll leave it to our kind of cool. So you all know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I want to thank you from Project Orange for, for giving this talk. It was really nice, and I'm let them present themselves, and that I think it's better. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and I want to thank you guys for letting us do this. You know, I mean, we're about to have our first show in Berlin, and so we're trying to kind of be here. I, I mean, I live here, Don lives in the USA, and uh, so it's nice that you would come. So let me properly introduce ourselves. My name is Mark Coniglio. I'm trained as a composer, but I'm also, a lot of people know me because I created the software called Isadora. And uh, so I happen to kind of play both roles. This is Dawn Stop Yellow. She's the choreographer of Troika Ranch. And uh, we've been working together for a long time and experimenting Since with this. the last of century, in fact. Yeah, <laughs> the last, yeah, oh, yeah. The last uh, millennium. Isn't that a century? Yeah. It's a century and a millennium. And a millennium, yeah. okay. Wow. Um, so I thought that I would start the night by just giving you a kind of uh, mini visual summary of what we've been doing for the last 20 years. And I thank Peter again for bringing the Wii controller so I could actually do this. Oh, I have to make sure the sound's working. Um, one moment. Let's plug it in. No, no, it'll work. It'll work. I just got to plug it in. No, not very good if it doesn't have any sound. All right. Let's see how we do. No, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine? So this is my little summary of what we've been doing. <coughs> oh, yeah, we'll go louder than that. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> Mullet. <laughs> we've been doing it for a long time. 
also the Mac Plus that is sitting there. <laughs> We've been doing it for a long time. Now, is one of those you gone? Yeah, the middle one is gone. The middle, middle one is gone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, it was in 1989 that um, uh, we were both studying at California Institute of the Arts, and I had this idea. Uh, my teacher, Mort Sabotnik, who's a composer who's worked with electronic music for a long time, had done this piece with something called an air drum. It doesn't exist anymore. It looked like two claves, two sticks about that big around and that long. And you could move it in the air, and it would produce MIDI information so you could play notes. And I saw that and instantly, because I was really interested in working in dance. Dawn and I had already made a, a yeah, little something together. Yeah, just to interject, we had been randomly paired in a composition class. Literally. <laughs> okay, you and you made something. Yeah, they paired so up dancers and choreographers in this class. <laughs> 20 years later. That's how it started. Sorry, Mark. That's all right. <laughs> And, um, and so I thought, I want to do that, and I want to put it on a dancer's body and, body, and I want it to be wireless. <laughs> so I basically, to make a kind of long story short, I ended up going to the Radio Shack, which is like Conrad's in Germany. Uh, I bought radio control cars, tore them to bits, and turned them into a system where the dancers could, it would measure the flexion of their joints. If you know the cars, you know when you turn it, you have a knob like this. Well, that knob went here. Yeah. And that sent the information to a receiver that converted it into MIDI information that went into this program that I had written at the time under Mort's direction called Interactor. It was around for a little while. Uh, we sold it, but no one, it wasn't really so interesting for people. But, but the point was, is that it actually did work. And we were able to have the physicality of the dancers turn into another medium. And, you know, I can't say that I would want to show you this piece because it's not it's not great. Because at that time the fact that we that Dawn could go bong <laughs> just like I did with the Wii controller. Nobody's gonna run home tonight and say he used a Wii controller to control something that's amazing. <laughs> but in nineteen eighty nine when she made that first note with her arm it, it was, was kind of spectacular. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that it could but actually it, and work. And you have to realize, there, you couldn't even play video on a computer at that point. This yeah. was a computer. There was no yeah. way. So. so that was the beginning. And then I continued to develop and work on the MIDI dancer. And that takes us to a more important point in our career. Because we were trying a lot of different things, too. And we didn't know what we were doing. We just wanted to see how we could bring these two mediums together. <laughs> but so, so now I jump forward five years to 1994, and that's a piece that we did that, that kind of put us on the map, I guess, if we're, if there's not, we're not really not on the map, but if we were on the map, we would be on it maybe because of this. And I had completely redesigned the MIDI dancer. It, instead of using potentiometers, little knobs, it now used flexion sensors. The transmitter was far more sophisticated, and it was much easier to wear. I mean, you should talk for a minute about the, the way the physical interface changed. Well, maybe. you know, you had to wear a box on your body on your back like a jet. The first one. The first one, yeah. And the potentiometer um, had to be sort of, <laughs> we had to tape a little metal tube to our skin and so that the wire could actually go move with your body. I mean, you if you fix something to your body, it has to have a certain amount of give because the body gives in these certain ways. So I was the research and development department. <laughs> How do you make a suit well, that especially, actually... Especially for the physical wearable part of the interface, yeah. that was Dawn's doing. Yeah, and then, uh, so it was really clunky. Yeah, it was like a big metal armature on your arm. The next iteration were these flexion sensors that were much, it just the feeling of them felt better, right? Uh, but then the issue became, how do you make a harness for this thing that you can keep the MIDI dancer in place where it needs to stay, can't move off your joint, keep it in place, and then also be able to later wash the costume. So you have to pull it all out and then put it back together. And this was actually, you know, a year of sort of figuring things yeah, out. Yeah, because, you know, we're doing everything ourselves. None yeah. of this stuff exists. I'm building every bit of hardware that we have because it yeah. doesn't simply, it simply and, doesn't exist. And actually, in the residency, the, one of the early ones making this piece, the, we worked with a costume designer, and she made a unitard. Does anyone know? You know, <laughs> hard, so giant leotard for the whole body. We made like a two, put them together so that it was a, an envelope, so that all the wires could go between the two, and that but, was our. But it's an interesting. Uh, you'll see it in a minute. But it, pay attention to it because it was a very interesting choice on our part. We tried to hide it so that nobody could see that there was a device. Mm. That brings up some points. But l let me show you a little bit of this video. Just two sections of the piece. 
Uh, the first thing you'll see is the opening, the very opening, and I, I think. Uh, yeah. Have you mentioned video yet, or after? After. Okay. So. <laughs> Of the wrist at the end, 
That was just, it's a higher velocity movement allowed her to add an accent, yeah? So that's, let, let me go ahead, let me show the next part now. Let's show a little bit later in the piece. talked a lot about the gear already. It's not really the point of why we're doing this, right? We're trying to make a piece. And so the thing is, in this piece, what we had in mind was this was a kind of competition. And it's, it's, a, it's an idea that is, is germane, germane to the 90s because yeah. all of this was really new. I mean, if, if you weren't there, and, and some of you were young when it happened, weren't. <laughs> uh, we weren't. But um, it, it really was a, a notion. It's like, you know, the internet appeared that, that year. That year, actually. I yeah. mean, really, in a real way. Um, and, and so, and so the questions were coming up, and so this was really a kind of contrast between the a machine, the sounds are the sounds of machines, except for that moment when suddenly it's the sound of human breath. The um, costume is silver, it has its own machine quality, but the thing is, and if you saw the full piece, but you get a sense of it here, it's super physical. I mean, I think Dawn forever damaged her wrist in this piece, because she kept falling to the floor so much. And it's an extremely physical piece. By the end of the 12 minutes or however long it is, she's just drenched in sweat. I mean, it, sometimes it would fly into the audience. And that's the corporeal property inside of all of that machine. And it was the contrast between those two elements. That's what we were going after. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit why it's named, you know, Well, insane. They're, they're, you know, video is seductive, right? It's like it can do things we can't do in real life. So there's a kind of like enticement that happens with video. <gasps> so amazing. But it's really just light on a wall, right? So it's not three-dimensional. It can't come to you and touch you. You know, it can't like touch you, really, is the thing. So it was a contrast between the seductiveness, seductivity, I don't know, mm -hmm. of video as an idea. It can go really fast, it can pause in midair, and the seductiveness of a human who's breathing and working, and you can hear the floor, you can feel the sweat fly off, that's another kind of seduction. So, or reality, really, right? So, we were trying to contrast these two, and the piece is called In Plane, because the video, while it is a seductive thing, is trapped on the back wall. It can't leave that space, and that's why the, I don't know if you can barely see it, there's a video projector on a track moving across the stage. That Dawn was also controlling. It was a 24 foot long track, and the motor could move the projector because we wanted to let the image travel with Dawn. And so I built this crazy device to <laughs> allow that to happen. And then actually, in the end of the piece, I actually jump over the track outside of the space and do something kind of intense when the video is still trapped back in there. So, it's, in a way, I sort of win. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. But, but the point was is that. We were really, two, we had two things that we were happening. We were extremely interested in what this technology to do, could do to express an idea, but also uh, we wanted to make a piece that was interesting on its own. We, I mean, that's always been the point, I think, and many other artists have made the point that, you know, it's not about the technology, but 
It is a little bit. I, I, you can't argue the fact that we were really interested in this idea, and sometimes more than others. Sometimes it was more about the technology, and sometimes it was more about the piece. It depended. I think but it was always a comment within the whole piece about the technology, but the technology was not the star of the piece. Yeah. It was a supportive entity that allowed some parts of it to be expressed. But I, I, you missed Frieder's talk. Yeah. If some of you may know Frieder Weiss, who worked uh, here in Berlin. He's, a, he's like my parallel. We've done the same thing somehow <laughs> our whole life. And he worked a lot with Chunky Moog, if you know Glow, or pieces like this. And he gave a talk last night that I went to see that was great. And he showed something that I wish I had to show you right now. Because I wanted to talk about this suit a little bit. Because you really couldn't tell that she had the device was there. And so when people saw this, the immediate assumption was she's just really in sync with the music. Yeah. She's just really in sync with the video. And that wasn't the case because the experience was people weren't ready yet to believe this didn't exist for 10 years already. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't see it. And Frieder pointed out in, the, in his talk, he showed an early palindrome thing where they did a muscle sensor thing, but they had to use a wire. Mm -hmm. And he said and it, was, it was actually brilliant that yeah. the wire was there because people immediately understood it was real. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the MIDI dancer, with it all hidden inside of this thing, you, you wouldn't assume, in fact, that it was happening. So I thought it was a really interesting point that you made last night. So, <clears throat> but that was a conscious decision too, and that was a way of attempting to not focus on the device, even though it was important for us. And I think one of the things that we came to in this time was that uh, we went back and forth. And for some time, we put stuff in the program. This is how it works. And then people would come to us after the show, well, I'm not sure if I saw how that was working. And we realized we put the focus completely in the wrong place. They missed the piece because they were trying to figure out how it was working. Right. And, and, and so we just stopped with that. We stopped putting program notes. We stopped explaining it. We just let it be. And if people knew it, then they got it. And if they didn't, they didn't. And that's kind of the way it worked. So we should probably move on. But this, this was an important piece in, in the sense that it defined a lot of things for us. It cleared the way for us to move to kind of what we were going to head to next, I think. I just will add the last thing is that at this time, um, the idea of new, new, big, new, new, new was really rampant, meaning you didn't stick with anything long enough because the next new thing came and you went to that. And there's still some of that happening. But we made a commitment at that time because we were thinking of the MIDI dancer as an instrument that you couldn't possibly learn to play it in any less time than 10 years. You can't play the piano well in a month. You need 10 years to play it well. So we committed to this system as a kind of like proof that there was more inside of it than we knew there was. We're beginners at this point. And we did that, and it was uh, fruitful. And then at a certain point, we're like, OK, done. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> and new things were available, actually, yeah. that weren't available at the time. So, so OK, let's, let's, let's take the next step, though. Several years. Six well, years. six years, <laughs> because um, all of this was made with that software interactor that I described, right? Because it was all with MIDI. In fact, even the, the images you saw, this was a laser disc player, the old, like, it looked like a, like a giant CD, right? And we were sending commands via a serial port to make it jump around and move in different directions and things like that. So it was before you could actually play video on a computer, that was the only way to do it, yeah? And so... But in 2000, something really important happened because I was struggling with Interactor. It didn't let me do what I wanted to do. And it was around the time of In Plane, or a few years later, that I saw, it went to the Studio for Electro Instrumental Music in Amsterdam, or Stein. And there I saw a software called Imagine, which allowed you to do real-time video processing uh, on a com personal computer with MIDI control. And that was, that was a beautiful software. And it worked, it, it, the images were really nice. The problem I had with it, it didn't suit my taste as a, as a creator, like the way you touched it and the way you worked with it. it. It uses these kind of tables and things, and that wasn't my favorite. And so I, I got to the point where I really wanted to work with this in some way, and I said, okay, I'm just going to make it myself. And that's where Isadora came to be. So I, I think, does everyone here know Isadora? Because I really, no, okay, I'll take a minute to talk about it, just for the people that don't. I'll just no, add while you're saying that, yeah. while you're doing that, is we started teaching workshops in 1999 in New York, when we were living in New York, and the workshops were for movement artists or that wanted to work with media somehow. Um, but there wasn't, you know, Google, and there, you couldn't, there was nothing available, so we had to kind of make 
our own systems for them to work with. And Interactor and other systems imagine were so complex that to get anything done creatively, it took a whole week just to learn the software. It was too complex. And so part of what Mark's um, kind of mandate for himself was, was how can I make this software robust to do what I wanted to do, but also have an interface and a way of using it, manipulating it, that a dancer who doesn't touch computers very often would get it, would understand it. And I think that's part, a big part of the success well, of Visitor. That was actually part of it too, because we actually tried to do a workshop where we used my software interactor, which is a and imagine, and the dancers wanted to kill themselves. Yeah. They really <laughs> they no longer want to work with computers. Yeah, they were like, we. I think we t we killed the instinct of, of working yeah. with technology in about ten people that year. Yeah. So, so. Actually, the presentation, the way I'm, I don't use PowerPoint, I use Isadora to do my presentations, but this is what it looks like, basically. It's um, just some modules here, and I'm going to show you how they work in a moment. And there's, along the bottom is what's called the scene, where I'm pointing my cursor, is the scene list. It's a scene-based software. It works like a light board. You have a scene, you know, where the lights are in one configuration, white light on my head, and the next scene is red light all over the stage, and you can move from scene to scene. It comes really totally out of the model of a light board, but it's also a construct of time because we were working with time. We wanted things to be able to develop and change over time, and that structure supported it. But to show you how it works, so here's something called a video in watcher, and here's a projector. And I'm going to skip this one for a minute and just take those. So the video in watcher takes video from the oh, camera, that camera, and no, it should be oh, this okay. one, and uh, the projector takes inform lets you see it, and this is. The video, this would be the output of the video projector. So to see that image, you would simply take a wire, like it was a DVD player and a television, and connect it. So there's gone. Yeah? <laughs> and um, so pretty simple, we're just getting a live video feed of Dawn. But the other kinds of things that you can do with it is that we can take this actor, which is called Dots, and now we've transformed Dawn into a series of dots. A little dark in here for that, but I'm going to brighten this up a little bit. So turn the lights up. Actually, yeah, it's bright. Yeah, anyway, you get the idea. You see her there, yeah. Or maybe it's easier if I here. Let's let's yeah. Let's do a let's do a video inverter to make it negative so that her black outfit is white and vice versa. So like so. Ah, there she is. Yeah. Okay, so now see that's an important reaction. Everybody, everybody loved it. It's that moment of magic that I'm talking about because it's somehow I just turned her into a series of halftone dots. Into the Michelin Man. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 And I always, I always use this module because it's so clear. You instantly understand what it's doing, right? But. That's just one part of it, so changing the way the image looked, that's one of the powers of the software, is that you can manipulate imagery and do interesting things with it. But the other element is that element of interactivity, is how you take information from the world and use it to manipulate what's going on. So I'm going to connect another module here. We'll actually just look at it for a second here. If I zoom in, you see some numbers. If I'm quiet, which I never am. It's low, but it, yeah, there you go, someone much old. So you see that these numbers are changing based on the volume of my voice, yeah? And so if I take that number and connect it into this input, which is called dot size, now, so the size of the dots, the size of the dots is being controlled by the volume of my voice, right? Very simple. Or, since I'm using it for my, uh, you saw me do this business at the beginning. God, Peter, I couldn't believe how I really had to like, you must have a, I don't know if there's a, an adjustment, you must like really beat your weed. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> beat your weed. Great, that has to go on the five second beat yeah. off the way. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that was a good one. Okay. For posterity. Yeah, you know, if you weren't webcasting it, I never would have said something so embarrassing to myself. Of course. But here's a different thing. Here's um here's a list here's a thing that's listening to the Wii. And let me see which one it is. 
Yeah. So here, if I point the nose of the Wii down, this number here, this 5, 4, 7, whatever, is low. If I go like this, it goes up to nearly 250. Yeah? So just like the sound level watcher, I can hook that up to this number. If I point the nose of the Wii down, they're small, and as I rotate it this way, the dots get bigger. Right? So now I have a gestural interface that is responding quite sensitively to the way in which I'm moving, to the orientation of the thing in space. And the thing that's great is that Nintendo spent a few million dollars <laughs> making this for you, and it costs you 40 right? And, and so you've actually got a very robust piece of technology. We've done experiments where we've mounted. You can take even four of these in at the same time into the computer, and have we've mounted them on the body of the dancer to measure the orientation of the joints in relation to the ground. It is very usable, yeah? So, you know, it's, it's like, again, I had to build all that stuff in the beginning, but now it just exists. And that's actually one of the important things I want to get to, is that what's great about the times we live in now is that back then we had to struggle just to make this. Now it's made for us, and the question becomes, what am I doing with it? That's the more important question that people need to ask, and that, that question is getting asked more readily these days than it was when we first began, because we were occupied with simply making it work. Anyway, let me show you, I have to turn a few things off so you can build this. All right, so, all right, there's Dawn again. And, uh, oh, it's really bright now. Oh. Yeah. Wait, something's still on. Something's not bypassed. Right? Yeah, I think the motion blur's still on. All right, well, anyway, um, let me just disconnect that one for a second. Okay, there's Dawn. Now, here, the first effect is one called difference. This is very simple. It looks at the previous frame and the current frame, and wherever it's different, you see light. So if she's still, it's black. But if she moves, you see that little outline, yeah? Okay, it, it's kind of nice, it's a bit ghostly, that sort of thing, right? <laughs> um, it's not very bright, so I'm going to put a contrast adjust actor to increase the brightness a bit so it, it stands out a little bit more. Try it again. So now you can just see it a little bit better, nothing too special there. But if we add another actor called motion blur, this is kind of like a memory, a little memory of what's been going on. And now if she moves, <laughs> see now you start to see these beautiful trails of what she's doing, right? And then the final step is I'm going to take this and turn on a little blur. So now we get, and I'm going to make this full screen so we can really appreciate it. We get really this beautiful ghostly image of her movement that even if you press it far enough, it'll no longer look like a body. It'll look like shapes and abstract images. Yeah. And who's looking at Dawn right now? Nobody. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just because she's not right here. It, it, even if she was standing right here in front of the screen, your eyes would be... And I wanted to point it out. That's the thing that Dawn was talking about before. Not only is it seductive, it's usually the brightest thing in the room. So you can't help but like stare at it. Yeah, I like the, the story I always tell at this point, but it's a good one. But you know, when you're growing up, your mother tells you, or if, if, you ever, if you ever see a guy with a welding torch and it's really bright, the guy who wears the special glasses, don't look directly at it because you'll burn your eyes. And what do you do when you see that light? You look directly at it every single time. Because as human beings, we're trained to pick out the brightest thing because it's part of survival, yeah. right? And so this. This problem of how the screen is lit and the light that it produces is part of the dilemma of putting dancers. And, and this, again, a colleague of ours, Robert Wexler, has written this very <laughs> powerful essay saying it's impossible to put a dancer oh, on stage with, with, a, with a video and make it work, yeah? So, okay, so um, just a couple other quick things just to show you. So this just takes, you, yeah, you can just go ahead and demonstrate it. So here... This is just a simple thing of playing with a video delay. Because what's easy to do with Isadora is to change the image, to change its physical characteristics, and to play with time. And so, as you can see, there's a long delay between what Dawn's doing and what you see in the camera. Right? 
And then just one last one. I just show this because it's so. Um, oh no, actually two more. This is really fun. You can can you stand by the radiator and move the chair? Okay. So Dawn's gonna dance a little phrase. Ready? Go. Okay, there she was. Now I've got the Wii. So here I'm tilting the Wii controller, and I can scrub that image. Right. Now, <laughs> yeah. so another kind of relationship, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, womp, womp, womp. but see, but let's actually, let's use this, because this will come up in a moment where we really start talking about a loop diver, but let's make a new game. So this is the game of like, oh wow, we can manipulate the image that we just stored, but here's a different problem. Don, you're going to look at that and do exactly what you see. Ready? Now don't look at the screen, only look at Dawn right now. Don't look at the screen. <laughs> okay, so I, I want you to pay attention to that because we're going to come back to that as an idea. That not looking at the screen, looking at Dawn as she's using this as a source of information. Keep that in mind for later. And then the last thing that we'll do, this one I just like to show because it's just so damn beautiful. And now the problem is, now the thing is, not only are you not looking at Don, you don't want to look at Don. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's so seductive and so yeah. gorgeous. It, it, isn't it? I mean, it's really, it's a wonderful, it's one plug-in by this guy, uh, Pete Warden. So beautiful in what it produces. But the big question is, how do you put that together? So It's always the question, it's composition, yeah? How do you compose with these so seductive things that they just like take over? And it, oddly enough, in Troika Ranch's work, there's very few effects, I have to say, right? We hardly yeah. ever use effects. And the only time we do use them is when it exposes or expresses something that's important about the piece. Like, we need this ghosty, beautiful moment where this lady emerges from the screen as a wispy, like, ghosty, lovely, seductive thing. We might use that for that, right? But not, not unless we came to it through the creative process in the studio. So let's, okay. let's go on now, because uh, we're going to go on. To, so this let, the invention of this software, we also didn't know what we were doing again. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We had to figure out what it meant. It was a new kind of instrument. We made a piece called Rian Rian that used it to a certain extent. The MIDI dancer was used for that piece, and, and we worked with that. But, um, but it, the next piece after that was the one I would say where we kind of got a handle on it. And that's what I want to show you a little bit of now. So now we jump forward a little bit more to 2003. Oh, except we didn't jump there. No, Try it again. There we go, 2003. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. So we started working with um, different ways of projecting. That was the key because this problem of the dancer and how, how you looked at it was a big problem and we wanted to try to find a way to address it. So I'm going to show you two clips from this piece that are quite different in the way they work. And then I want to talk about what they were going after. So. Sorry, very distorted. Forgive me.
So I want to tell you a little bit about the process of this piece, how it came to be, and why a couple things that are going on there. First of all, we didn't know it at the time, but this piece was our response to being in New York for 2000, uh, 9-11. Yeah? And what we started out with was this process was uh, we gave our dancers uh, a tech we played a game for about three months. We were working on a different piece already. And um, we gave each other a kind of secret, sa secret Santa game. We all had to take objects, weird things that we found that we thought were suggestive, and we'd sneak them into their bags, into their shoes, into, you know, where they would find them without knowing who gave it to them. And so we all accumulated, I don't know, 15 or 20 things, yeah? yeah? And, and then, because we had an improvisational speaking process that we used to generate text and ideas for the piece, and everyone in the group was trained in this. So at a certain point when we began in earnest on the piece, each person had to lay those objects in front of them and do this very long improvisational speech about who the person was who owned that object. The instruction was, you have amnesia, you don't know anything about who you are, but you have these objects to tell you who you were. And so that's what we did. They, they did this improv and everyone took <coughs> notes and they developed these characters. So specifically, let me tell you, let Dawn tell you about the one she developed for this, <laughs> this particular character in the piece. Well, they all had names. I think she was called Zelda. Mm -hmm. And um, I think she was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she had been a prostitute or something in Japan. I'm trying to remember all the stuff that she did because it was crazy. Um, but the crux of the piece, too, was about memory based on September 11th. I just wanted to go back to that because right after that event, the streets were covered with photographs and notes about missing people. Have you seen my son? Have you seen my wife? And it felt really invasive to be looking at these personal... Because they were vacations, they were weddings, they were bar mitzvahs, they were, you know, baby showers, you name it. I mean, it was like such private photos so that they could get you that image of the person they wanted to find. And we started then talking about memory and memorializing, which, you know, it was a long process of making a memorial for that event in New York City, but also how memories distort over time, and actually there's scientific evidence about this now. Every time you pull a memory out and you tell someone, it changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so we, were we were thinking a lot about how you retain memories, what memories you retain. Like, why can't I remember really stupid things? And I can't remember, you know, my first boyfriend's name or whatever it was. Um, so in any case, <coughs> this character's... So we gave... The, the notion was each four characters, each of the four characters had a moment in their life that was a significant memory for them. Mine was winning a poetry contest in the sixth grade, this lady, who then, that was her sixth grade achievement moment, and then her life fell apart after that, and she became a drunk <laughs> prostitute in Japan or something, I forget exactly. So this is her sort of, uh, you don't, may not recognize it, but she does a lot of writing stuff on her body and on her face and stuff, but she's also a little out of her mind. And, and what you're hearing, the sound you're hearing, is samples of Dawn's voice reading the poem that are all chopped up as a mini dancer. So the words that are being emanated from her limbs, she knows certain things that she can do. They're actually down to the phoneme, like the individual sounds. And she's just making this kind of musical configuration, constellation of these words and phonemes through the way in which she's doing this improvisation, yeah? But the most, important, the most important thing, and this was because Isadora made it possible to do it, look at the screen, which isn't really a screen, right? It's actually composed of, of 18, or I'm not exactly sure the number, panels. And each panel is essentially two meters, and well, not quite two meters, but you know, nearly two meters, and like about this big. In other words, it's the size of me. And this was a mistake. This was not planned, in fact. It was an instinct of the, our set designer who was thinking about looking into windows. We felt like we were looking into the windows of the private lives of the people we saw in those notices. But what happened was, in Isadora, I could put an individual image in each one of these if I wanted to. Now here, that's one image, those three, that's one over there, that's one over there. It's all coming from a wireless camera that's looking at Dawn's feet. The image really isn't important. It's about rhythm. It's a kind of rhythm behind her. That's the only function of it. It's not that it's telling you a story. But the key was that it was possible, if we wanted to, to focus in on one of these. Because when you had an image here and a dancer here, you can look at it. It's different than when it's the giant thing. And so we could make then a choice about where the eye of the, of the audience was
was going, because we could actually make it a duet where one was not overpowering the other, and it was simply a matter of scale. It was a very simple approach, right? But, and it really was an accident, but we couldn't have done it if the technology hadn't existed to allow us to actually position those images, right? And it so, also supports the metaphor of the fractured memory. Nothing is connected fully ever in terms of an image, video image. Yeah. Now, the next clip, I, for, I you know, I real, I say to Dawn, there's a bunch of stuff that I don't have that she has back in Portland that I need to get, and one of them is the full DVD of this piece. So I only have part of what I'd like to show you for the next clip, but I have to, so I have to tell you what happened right before you, you'll see this. The dancer goes to a camera. There's the sound of actually a camera shutter going like that, and she just does one of these improvs. It's like... She looks into the camera and she's saying, I thought about the thing that you told me and I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember why you put me into the bathtub and why you had to, why you had to, why the hot water was so hot, it was so hot. You know, it goes on like this for like about 30 seconds. The computer records it and stores it in, in the memory of the computer, just like you saw me do a moment ago, but it also stores the audio. And then it becomes about a manipulation of that recorded image with the MIDI dancer system. So you're missing the part where she speaks into the camera, but you're seeing the result right after this. Oh, put that build the same one. Oh, why don't we try doing the right one? How about that? Okay, forgive me, my, mis my mistake. I have to bring that in in a second. The other, well, Go ahead, say, you uh, can just say something. Another thing we were examining in future memory that was another aspect of the memory thing is that we wanted to give the audience who was there that night a kind of thing to remember from the piece. So we, we would do these improvisational speeches and movements that would be recorded early in the piece and then would show up again later in the piece so that they might even have that moment of like, wait a minute, didn't I see that earlier? Kind of thing. And it was improvised each night. So even for us, it was a new... Um, infusion of an idea that got memor memorized by us and memorized by them. Well, the, the point is, is that, that there were all kinds of things. There were mm -hmm. things that happened in the first five minutes that reappear 45 minutes later. This one happens then, and 10 seconds later, it's right. being seen in a different way. But the point is, it's not, it's not pristine. It's been manipulated. It's like a memory that's changing and evolving and decaying mm -hmm. over time. That was the idea we were trying to work with, and I think it'll work now speed and intensity of the visual effects, All right. while the flexion and velocity of the individual Sorry, joints is used to trigger also visual notes or second. phrases and to manipulate their timbre. change the way it was behaving, but also I think we kind of had a good handle on the relationship between this media and how it was being controlled, and, uh, and it was nice because this was a piece that we got a, a small prize at the Pre-Ars Electronica, so I think that, I guess somebody else thought we did okay too. Um, <laughs> our time out. That's the award for this piece. Yeah, that's right, we got, got a few award. awards for this one, so yeah, it went okay. Um, but. Uh, so, yeah, I'll look, let's see at the end if I can show you that clip, I apologize. This I'm is the, also the, um, the end of the MIDI dancer. Yeah. <laughs> this is the retirement piece of the MIDI dancer. Uh, you know, four people have four sensors. I think we really understood how to compose for the MIDI dancer in relationship. Because you have to think about, I just want to say this, this instrument is ridiculously expressive. It does so much with so little. The MIDI dancer and the computer sees nothing, practically. It sees like a minute fraction of what the body's actually doing. So what you have to do is take this expressivity, run it, like sift it way down into these little zeros and ones that like are like clicking, switching things, and then on the output, send something out that's as expressive as this. And it's not, it's hard. But when you do it enough times, you start to understand, like, what is my body expressing that, that, how do I explain this, 
that the MIDI dancer isn't seeing, really, but that I'm expressing through myself in partnership with the MIDI dancer, in partnership with the imagery and the sound. Maybe that wasn't entirely you know, clear, I, but well, <laughs> you get know, the idea. Also, this thing is so expressive, and these sensors are just not. So it's it's a real job to take the little bit of data that they read and see and put something out that is meaningful. Yeah, I realize we're we're kind of being yeah. expansive with the talk. Right. We're taking no, no, no. I mean, I'm doing it too, and I wanted to kind of go over this history because I realized when I saw Frieder last night, who's been doing this as long as I. You know, it was a couple of the young artists who showed after him came up and talked to him and I, saying, we're still asking the same questions. And yeah. I feel like talking about some of this kind of history is actually really useful for people to see. But I'm going to try and... Okay. The next piece was actually... No, no, the next piece is actually also a big step. But I'm going to condense it because I really want to get to Loop Diver and I don't want to go too much more than an hour because that's just too much of talking. <laughs> so... Um, but let me show you one section. This, let me just say about this piece. We completely switched our methodology. We started working with infrared camera tracking. And this is called 16 Revolutions was the name of this piece. And so I'm just going to show you one section in which we really took that to its height in terms of tracking the movements of the body and producing music with it. And the thing about this that was mar marvelous was that there was no sensory system. It was completely markerless. It just looks at the image of the dancer and can figure out where her hands and feet are and allows it to produce uh, through Isadora. Then the information came in and we produced music and imagery. So let me, now I need to see if I can full screen it successfully. Let's see if I can. Yes. <coughs> So let me just show you this little section.
was a, you know, this was a very sophisticated thing. And the thing it is is that Lucia, we did we did the show more than we ever did any show. We got more performances than anything. And every night she did it was really different. I can tell you that this is a good performance. It's not her best performance because the improvisations were very different each night. And um, it, it's it's a good representation. But really, there were a couple nights when she just really had such a command of this instrument that she had learned because Dawn gave her a structure of how it was to go, the kind of arc, but the way in which it looked and the sounds, because it was analyzing the quality of her movement. You may have seen when she did kind of like like this, a kind of <laughs> sound appeared. That's because if, if, if the movements were jittery, if they were like more angular like this, that was quite a different sound than what you got if you made a movement like this. It was looking at the actual shapes that her body was making to control the sonic material. And then, of course, the traces that you see are... are um, just a representation in a way of where her hands and feet have been. It's the history of the dance she just did. Yeah, but actually. but the important thing dramaturgically, this table you saw she got up from the table. Before that, her and the one guy there on the left was there for about 12 minutes, a long time, and they're basically frozen. They can't do anything. It's quite uncomfortable for the audience this sequence because it's not exciting, and you're like, there's stuff going on, but it's small, and it's like, what's going on? It's because there's a kind of breakdown of these people over the whole piece. And she is the one who gets up and takes action. It's the first time you ever see color in the piece. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that someone really builds something out of this control. It's the first time you see a curved line. In other words, this moment is about the volition of this person deciding she's not going to be trapped by whatever, but instead going to take a step forward and make something happen inside of the world. That's the transformational moment. That's why this e section exists. Of course it's beautiful and it's spectacular looking, but it actually has a meaning. Every element that's in there was chosen in there to support an idea of what was going on in the greater arc of the piece. Well, we have this beautiful gift at this moment. We were working in a theater in Stuttgart and Peter became our dramaturg. We had never worked with someone called a dramaturg. <laughs> and it was fantastic because he asked us really hard questions about the process and about the arc of the piece. And one, we had many, many, many evenings of intense conversations and every day rehearsal would change in some way. But one really important thing that came out of those discussions and Peter's expertise was to give the media itself a dramatic arc mm -hmm. so that it had a development that made sense to the development of the physical piece that we were making. And what that was, was started with a straight line, a single straight line that appears to kind of go off into infinity. Then that line is able to move and expand based on the movement of the performer. Just expand and light his body. Then we get multiples of those lines, a kind of architecture where it looks almost like a cityscape and that they can fly out into space, and then we get one squiggly line. And then, a little bit later, we get this. So that, and then it goes, and then we get the roof of really squiggly lines that are squiggly, and it gets complex at the end. But my point is that there was a progression that was slow and aligned with the piece, and so that the media itself had a kind of narrative that supported our narrative. And, and it's the first time that you, you, work, you don't work with video in itself, 